thank you for everyone who is joining us on this webinar, which was developed in response to the coronavirus crisis. My name is Associate Professor Daniel Novakovic, and I'm an otolaryngologist in Sydney, Australia. I am also co-director of the Dr. Liang Voice Program at University of Sydney. Today, we wanted to speak to you about our experience of managing laryngeal and voice problems and also airway problems in the era of COVID-19. This is a slide of the Blackburn Building, which opened in 1933 as the Medical School at University of Sydney. It was demolished in 2017 to make way for our new Health Sciences Campus, incorporating the Faculties of Medicine and Speech Pathology, as well as the other allied health. This is a picture of the new building, which is now being completed. Up on the fifth floor is the location of our new Dr. Liang Voice Program, Research Laboratory into Voice and Laryngeal Disorders, which we will be moving into very shortly. This has been our world since early 2020. It has been turned upside down on its head. The world that we know it seems to have changed very suddenly. The cause of this is COVID-19, which occurs as a result of infection with the novel coronavirus. So what have we learned about COVID-19? We know that most people will have a mild flu-like illness before they recover. And this is especially true in younger people. There are, however, some high risk groups of people that don't do so well. This includes the elderly, overweight or obese people, and people with other diseases, including hypertension, heart or lung disease, cancer, immune compromise and diabetes. Males seem to be more severely affected than females. And there is some suggestion that cigarette smokers are also at increased risk from the virus. For healthcare workers, including ear, nose and throat surgeons, there is some bad news. The virus, which is called SARS-CoV-2, is extremely infectious. Not only can it be spread by droplets, but it can also be spread by aerosol transmission. And this virus can survive for up to days on some hard surfaces. People who become infected can be silent carriers and spread the virus for up to 10 days before developing symptoms. Loss of taste and smell is common, although this seems to recover in most cases. And early on in the piece, there were reports of death and serious illness in some ENT surgeons. We know that there are very high virus levels in the throat of infected people, and that high viral exposure can lead to more severe infection. And this is especially true when performing mucosal aerosol generating procedures on patients who have active infection. This includes endoscopy through the mouth or nose, respiratory testing, care of tracheostomy and laryngectomy patients, and all ENT procedures in the mouth, nose and throat. So when news of this virus and its effects came out earlier this year, we received certain recommendations from our colleagues and professional groups. Firstly, we were advised to delay any elective ENT surgery and perform urgent operations only. We were advised to triage patients to decide who needs urgent care and see those preferentially. We were advised to take measures to reduce risk, including minimizing face-to-face -face contact with patients screening patients before seeing them to make sure that they were at low risk of having the virus, minimising the number of people in our waiting room and minimising or avoiding aerosol generating procedures.
and we were also advised to protect ourselves with appropriate personal protective equipment. With the virus hitting, everything changed very quickly. We were thrown into the deep end and had to learn to swim. There was a change in the rules, there was a change in the thinking of people, a change in practice, and a change in the way that we had to deliver health care. So as ear, nose and throat surgeons, how did we adapt to the virus? There was a rapid transition to telehealth medicine. We started to gather a lot more information before seeing the patient, including a detailed referral, collecting patient reported outcome measures and triaging the urgency of the consultation. And we started to see if we can gather information remotely via telehealth during the consultation instead of examining the patient in person. Our transition to telehealth was not the same as seeing patients in person, but it allowed us to do a few things. Number one, we were able to formulate a likely diagnosis. And in the case of voice and laryngeal problems, we would either classify people as likely having an organic lesion, and this could include a cancerous or non-cancerous lesion, so high risk or low risk. We could classify them as having a functional problem with their voice or a combination possibly of organic disease and a functional problem such as vocal nodules. The telehealth process also allowed us to triage the patient based upon the likely diagnosis. And this allowed us to put them into a category for how urgently they required a laryngoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. And in some cases, we were able to start treatment before examining them, such as medical treatment of the nose or reflux. We were able to start ordering tests prior to seeing patients in person, and it allowed for early referral to a speech pathologist in many cases where organic pathology was not suspected. There have been challenges with our adoption of telehealth and our change to the new model. We are receiving new information daily or weekly, which has a constant effect upon our practice and causes us to change our thinking. The staff have needed to be trained in new systems. Patient compliance has been challenging, although this is improving over time, as many people still wanted to see the doctor in person. We have had to develop our systems in terms of collecting data and have now developed systems for collecting online questionnaires, especially for patient reported outcome measures. Billing and payments have been challenging uh, because there were no government systems for this to take place via telehealth. And there's been some technical challenges with video conferencing and the adoption of new technologies. Uh, but especially the most challenging thing has been limited resources and sometimes the inability, especially early on, of us to be able to get appropriate protective equipment because everyone in the world was trying to get the same equipment at the same time. The second part of my talk, I'll touch a little bit about the remote management of patients with laryngeal airway problems during the coronavirus crisis. Just a brief definition of what a laryngeal airway problem is or an airway patient is. This is someone who has a suspected or confirmed obstruction of the upper airways. This can be a fixed obstruction, including tracheal stenosis, subglottic stenosis, or narrowing of the vocal cords or supraglottis, or a dynamic or functional uh, airways obstruction, such as vocal cord dysfunction, laryngospasm or inducible laryngeal obstruction. You might think that this is a difficult thing to diagnose via telehealth. And so we have to have a framework of questions to ask the patients, especially the new ones we were seeing for the few months uh, that we were limited to telehealth. First of all, we wanted to know 
what is a diagnosis? Is this a fixed or a dynamic obstruction? And second of all, what is the urgency? Do these patients need to come into hospital immediately into the emergency department? Uh, is it a mild problem that can wait a little while? Or is this unlikely to be a, a significant risk to health? And the triage process, once again, as for voice disorders, really should guide us as to when they need to be examined and do they need surgery urgently. Telehealth, we can start to think about what other tests need to be organised and can we start other treatment, for example, medical therapy or breathing retraining therapy via the speech pathologist. For our existing airway patients, the telehealth consultation allowed us to monitor them remotely. And the questions that we would ask are, are the symptoms stable? Is the airway safe? Do they need to come in urgently for examination? And we needed to develop a plan about how do we monitor the airway remotely? And what is the plan for these patients who already have airway narrowing if they deteriorate during the COVID-19 crisis. So developing a treatment plan for each patient was very important if they had an airway issue. So what are our tools for monitoring patients with airway obstruction? We can ask them about their symptoms, that is subjective reports of their breathing. We can look at respiratory function tests to get an objective idea of how they're going. Endoscopy is always the gold standard method, but this is difficult to do via telehealth. And we're trying to keep these people out of the operating theater during the COVID-19 crisis and out of the clinic if possible. And lastly, imaging such as CT scans, which we'll talk about a bit further. So the symptoms we ask our existing patients about are increasing shortness of breath during exercise and at rest increasing cough and throat irritation and mucus plugs. And there is actually a validated symptom questionnaire called the dyspnea index, uh, which we have been administering to all of our upper airways obstruction patients, especially those with subglottic stenosis, to see if we can track their symptoms over time in a standardized fashion. I'm not sure if there is a Chinese version of this but the reference is there for you to look up. I think respiratory function tests are extremely useful in monitoring upper airway patients. And there are characteristic different flow volume loops. Often the respiratory physicians are more interested in the expiratory loop, which is above this line. But as ENT surgeons, we are especially interested in the inspiratory loop, which is the loop below the line, which can tell us about extrathoracic obstruction or fixed airway obstructions, such as we'd see in subglottic stenosis or tracheal stenosis. So this is an example of flow volume loops before and after treatment for subglottic stenosis. And these are the standard parameters that we would collect when these patients come in for clinical examination we would do a flow volume loop and especially look at the inspiratory portion by looking at the PIF or the peak inspiratory flow, which in this patient is 1.14, uh, and also looking at the peak expiratory flow. Now you can see after treatment that the flow volume loops are improved and the peak inspiratory flow, the PIF has gone up uh, as well as the peak expiratory flow. Uh, and the dyspnea index, which is the patient reported outcome measure we showed in the previous slide, has reduced from 21 out of 40 to eight of, out of 40, which is a significant improvement. Now, obviously we can't do flow volume loops over the computer, but what we can get the patient to do is to do a peak expiratory flow reading, which can help monitor their breathing over time. We encourage all of our upper airway patients, especially the subglottic stenosis patients to do this daily. And they do this by blowing into the meter three times and we record the highest value. And we ask them to record this on a spreadsheet, which is shared with us uh, in the cloud. We can then record these and make a graph 
uh, and this is uh, raw readings from a patient's um, peak expiratory flow meter daily readings. And you can see there's a lot of variability from day to day. However, if we average this over time, over 28 days, we get a very nice curve, uh, which shows an overall trend as to how the patient's airway is going. And in this patient, you can see here in October 2017, she has a dilatation of the airway and the peak expiratory flow improves from 200 litres per minute up to around 320 litres per minute. Over time, the airway deteriorates and she has another dilatation here uh, in no early November 2018. And you can see that the peak expiratory flow once again improves uh, before rapidly dropping off in June 2019. Now, this patient's interesting because at that point in time, we changed the way we managed her and started giving injections into the subglottic stenosis using steroid in the office to try and keep her out of the operating room. And you can see here that she had an injection in July and then again in November, uh, December, uh, and then again in um, uh, February. And on each occasion, the airway has improved. Imaging can be useful, especially if we cannot perform endoscopy and we can use serial CT scans to compare with previous examinations. Uh, here we see a CT scan of the neck, uh, which is non-contrast and done in Valsalva, i.e. the patient's vocal cords are closed. Uh, and this is a 3D reconstruction uh, of the patient's airway. And you can see there a few centimetres below the vocal cords, there's a mild narrowing. Uh, and this is consistent with what we see on laryngoscopy and office space transnasal tracheoscopy. So there's a mild narrowing, which we also see on the CT scan. So we can use this as a baseline. And if we're unable to perform endoscopy on the patient and they're having difficulty, maybe a repeat CT scan can be useful. And we use this as a, an adjunct to our other measurements. So what advice did we have for our laryngeal patients uh, during COVID-19? We told our patients that they are at high risk if they get infected with coronavirus. We recommended that they monitor their peak expiratory flow daily and they share this uh, with our team, our nurse and uh, the surgeons uh, using a spreadsheet. We advise them to work from home if possible and to practice social isolation. And we also started to see them a little bit more frequently than normal via telehealth uh, and gave them the tools uh, to recognize when things were getting worse. And we also helped them develop an action plan uh, in case the breathing did get worse or in case they did catch the virus. So what would happen if they caught the virus and needed to be intubated? So how do we decide uh, that things are getting worse, when do we start to worry? Well, if their symptoms progress, so if the exercise tolerance gets worse, or if the patient becomes concerned, or if their dyspnea index uh, patient questionnaire score uh, gets worse. Uh, secondly, airway measures, so a sustained decrease in peak expiratory flow would cause us to become concerned, and that's not decreasing for a day or two, but that's over a week if it didn't improve. Or if there was a progressive narrowing on the CT scan imaging, this would also cause us to become concerned and maybe bring the patient in for physical examination or for surgery earlier. So how have we been managing uh, these patients with airway obstruction? Well, all patients get screening or testing for COVID-19 uh, before we see them. If we see them in the clinic, we try to avoid anaesthetic sprays. We try to wear appropriate personal protective equipment and we try to avoid mucosal anesthesia. Now that's very difficult um, if we're performing endoscopy, uh, including laryngoscopy or transnasal tracheoscopy. Uh, and it made it challenging for us to perform office-based steroid injections when uh, the risk of COVID-19 uh, in our clinic was higher. 
uh, luckily we've been able to resume these because in Australia at the moment, uh, the risk of someone having COVID-19 is very, very low. Uh, it's less than the order of one in 100,000. When we take these patients to the operating room, once again, they're all either screened or tested beforehand. We're wearing appropriate personal protective equipment. We're trying to avoid aerosol generating procedures, including jet ventilation or laser and preferring uh, non-laser interventions. Uh, such as balloon dilatation and also with steroid injections. So just being very careful to reduce the risk of transmission of disease from a patient to the healthcare worker. In the office uh, and in the outpatient setting, uh, the aim once again is to reduce the risk to healthcare workers and other patients. We have sand hand sanitizer freely available. All of the patients have their temperature checked on arrival. We minimise the number of patients in the waiting room and ask the patients to stand apart 1.5 metres. Uh, we have separated our consultation room and our examination room to reduce the risk of contamination. And we have specific procedure days where we perform examinations. The examination room is fully cleaned between each patient uh, using either alcohol or sodium hypochlorite or hydrogen peroxide and uh, we have specialized scope cleaning for coronavirus and in our clinic we are using a negative pressure room uh, to make sure that any aerosol uh, coronavirus is flushed out of the room in between patients. What about personal protective equipment? What do we use and when do we use it? Do we give it to doctors, administration staff or patients? Uh, one of the problems we had in Australia is that there's limited availability of masks, especially between March and August. That's improving now. Uh, but we have to follow guidelines uh, from our professional bodies uh, and our institutions. Uh, some of the considerations are certainly what type of mask do we wear? Do we wear a standard surgical mask? Do we wear an N95 mask or a or a proper respirator. Uh, if we're wearing a respirator or an N95 mask, they need to be properly fit tested and the staff need to be trained in putting it on and taking it off again to minimize the risk of contamination. And how do we reuse this equipment and clean this equipment uh, in between patients? Uh, all of these are challenges that we're still working out. Uh, but um, once again, it depends on your institution and uh, your access to personal protective equipment. So I think in summary, COVID-19 has had a significant impact upon laryngology practice and uh, doctors and other clinicians uh, that treat voice and airway disorders. We've had to have a rapid adaptation to telehealth, uh, which allows us to triage their need for uh, clinical examination and endoscopy. Uh, allows for early referral to speech pathology. And we've also had to uh, improve our personal protective equipment protocols. Um, our airway patients have been able to be triaged via telehealth and we have been able to implement remote monitoring measures to help identify patients when they're getting worse, if they can't come and see us, and also to help formulate an emergency management plan for if the airway deteriorates or if they were to contract COVID-19. I thank you all for listening. Um, this is a picture of the Sydney Opera House, which has been lit up uh, in winter in our light festival. And when the borders reopen and we're able to travel between each other's countries, uh, we welcome you to visit us in Sydney. Thank you very much for your time.